Hi, welcome to another edition of This Issue. My guest this time is my dear friend, Russell Ray, an artist from Hancock, Maine. Russell, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bruce. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Let's start by looking at this beautiful wood sculptor that, of a whale that you made. You recently had a show in Bath at a gallery where you displayed many more of these amazing pieces of art that you've done. But let's talk about this one for a moment. Okay, um, <clears throat> the piece is called Lamentation. And uh, I guess it comes from a place where, um, well, it comes directly, actually. This is, this is a Cuvier's beaked whale. And the Cuvier's beaked whale are some of the whales that are frequently s stranded following Navy sonar exercises. And so uh, this is specifically about sonar caused harm. And um, I guess I use these two f women figures to express how I feel about this kind of thing happening. Um, the piece is called Lamentation, and it's expressing my grief over what's happening. So what actually happens to whales and dolphins when Navy uses sonar? What happens to them physically? Well, um, a lot of that depends upon how close they are to the sonar, um, to the source of the sound, um, how intense the sound is, and it can be intense at quite long, far distances. It doesn't, it's, it's a mistake to think that the sonar will only affect the whales and dolphins. And I should point out here right away that it's actually a misconception that it's only the whales and dolphins that are being impacted by Navy sonar. Really, a lot of ocean life is being impacted. Fish, invertebrates, sea turtles, sea birds are also impacted. Um, the public has the idea that it's mostly the whales and dolphins because that's when it used to make the, the news when there was a mass stranding event. But in fact, there's harm being done all the time and it's not necessarily to the whales and dolphins. So now recently you've been talking about a new Navy sonar testing area off the coast of the United States. Mm -hmm that is a breeding ground for whales. Can you briefly talk about sure, that? Sure, yeah. Um, the Navy is now having built, and it's an instrumented uh, sonar range. It's 500 square miles. It's going to be instrumented with cables and undersea uh, cables and uh, transducers and all these nodes that will pick up, and they'll be able to record the sound of uh, and what's happening with sonar and and the ships and the submarines, um, so they can um, learn from these exercises, I guess. But this uh, this this under it's called the Undersea Warfare Training Range. Now and where is it located? It's located off the coast of Florida and Georgia. Okay. Which happens to be the only known calving grounds of the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. And so the, is there going to be impact? There, w there will definitely be impacts, yes. And what does the Navy say about that? They, they must know, right? <clears throat> well, they, they do know. And the, the Navy is, um, in my opinion and many others, uh, the Navy is expert at denial. <laughs> at denial? At denial, yes. They, they are required to write environmental impact statements for their different programs. And they've, I have, uh, as, as a member of COAST, I have written comments on many of these environmental impact statements. And they are just experts at, at going through the motions of writing these environmental impact statements, but in the end, denying that there's going to be anything serious happening that will be negative. Now, you just mentioned COAST. That's the name of a group that you started, right. COAST, that stands for Citizens Opposing Active Sonar Threats. So besides being a, an artist, uh, and you do a lot of uh, your sculptors are around whales and ocean life and things like that, but you also once worked for Greenpeace uh, 
and walked all the way across America pulling a life-size dolphin that you sculpted. So you've been at this both art and consciousness raising for a long time. What turned you into an activist focusing on this Navy sonar issue? How'd you get started with it? For whatever reason, and I don't actually know the reason, as a kid, as a young child, I drew uh, dolphins and whales. Um, literally, I have an oil painting I did of a dolphin when I was eight years old. I have a wood carving I did of a sperm whale when I was nine. Um, I don't know where that came from because I didn't grow up right on the shore or anything, but um, I just had a fascination with the whales and dolphins. And the more I learned, the greater that became and the more it turned also into love. I, I just love them. They're these amazing creatures. You know, we talk about, we talk about uh, finding extraterrestrial intelligent life, but we don't need to go outside of this planet to find other intelligent life. There's consciousness right here in our oceans and, and on the land too. But um, so, so it was through the love of, that I have for the whales and dolphins that actually they led me into becoming an activist because um, when, I, when I was in my art school days and I learned about what was going on with whaling at that time, whaling was really threatening the survival of, of many species. And, I, and it was actually in art school when I first heard about Greenpeace and that was in the begin very, very close to the beginning. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to go, I want to, I want to do that. And um, yeah, so, that, so it was the whales that led me into it. So here we have whaling, which was killing the whales, right? Mm. And over time, the public developed a consciousness about that. And it's not completely outlawed today, but, it, no. but it's not as bad as it once was. But now today, the sonar from the Navy, would you say is kind of similar to whaling in a way that, 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 in, the, in that it has a deadly impact on, on sea life? Yes. Um, of course, the Navy is not intentionally any longer trying to kill whales, but they're doing it. And um, yes, yeah, so, and it is having an impact and it will, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, this undersea warfare training range, out of the whole East Coast, they wanted to build this range somewhere on the East Coast. Out of the whole East Coast, they chose just offshore of, this only, of the only known calving grounds of these right whale. And the right whale is one of the most critically endangered whales on the planet. It's very, very endangered. So the Navy picked really the most sensitive Absolutely. spot. Absolutely, yes. Intentionally, obviously. They, they were yeah. made aware that this is... Oh, they, they were very aware of it, yes. Why do you think they did that? Because the Navy, as I see it, is interested in one thing, and that's what is good for the Navy, what's convenient for the Navy, and what works for the Navy. They don't care, apparently, about their impacts on... I mean, that's very clear. I mean, we see that everywhere, that they... they, they work to further their interests. Let me share a story with you. A couple of years ago, I went to a family reunion here in Maine, and I was talking to one sort of distant cousin uh, at the family reunion, and I was telling him that, uh, you know, that I'm a peace activist and that I often protest outside of Bath Ironworks. And I did this because when we were introduced, he uh, said that he worked at Bath Ironworks. Mm. And so I asked him what he thought about our protests. And he said, uh, I'm really glad you have them. He said, I wish I didn't have to work there, mm. but I do it because, you know, I've been there 20 years and I need the pay, you know, I have my family and everything else. Right. And he told a story. He said, my job uh, at one point was to paint the side of the ships. And when they would be, when they're, you know, in, still being worked on, mm -hmm. and they would be testing the sonar, and he said, here he is painting the side of the ships, and he would see all these dead fish 
floating on top yeah. that were killed by the testing of the sonar on the ships. Mm -hmm. And he said and he would be, he's a fisherman. He loves fish. He loves sea life. And he said he, and, and as he told me this story, he started crying. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't even know that this kind of thing would happen as the ship was sitting there being worked on uh, at right. BIW, right. that they would already be impacting sea life even before it left Bath. Any comment yeah. on that? Yeah, well, the, unfortunately, they do do pier side uh, sonar training or um, testing, rather. And of course, the painting, I mean, how is that affecting the water? We got to ask that question. I think the shipbuilding itself has creates problems. And as you know, the dredging, and et cetera. Yeah, talk, can you say anything about the dredging? Do you know much about well, that? Well, actually, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I. I'm sure it's harmful to some of the bottom dwellers and, and to it, it's obviously quite disruptive of the, of the local ecosystem, I would guess. Yeah. yeah. So what has your, been your experience then? How many years would you say you've been actively engaged in this sonar issue? Well, I can tell you exactly. It's been 17 years, just 17. about. Just about, because I... I, um, I began it, I, I started, well, I first heard about it, actually, because I was running an art gallery up in Han or Sullivan at that time. And I had a lot of whale sculptures, and uh, this woman stopped in. And she was immediately drawn to my sculpture and started talking about the Navy sonar. And I didn't know anything about it. I hadn't heard anything about it at the time. But this woman was Marsha Green, who runs the Ocean Mammal Institute. And she was organizing, at that time, a conference that was going to be at COA. Um, at where? At College of the Atlantic. Oh, OK. Um, in a couple, in like a, the next month. And it was on sonar. And so I went to this. She invited me to come to this uh, conference, and I did. And Joel Reynolds from NRDC, who was they were leading the, the, uh, uh, the struggle to try to rein in the Navy's use of sonar. Um, he was there, and a, bunch, a lot of the people who were involved in the sonar work were there, so it was a great opportunity for me to suddenly you know, come up to speed about what was going on. So anyways, and, and shortly after that, I started Citizens Opposing Sonar, uh, Active Sonar Threats. So what's yeah. been your experience then of doing this work? Well, uh, it's when some of the part of the work that I've been doing has been the Navy is constantly coming out with environmental impact statements, as I mentioned. And that part of my work, I, I, I responded. There's, a, there's this whole process where the public is allowed to participate and supposedly make their voices heard, supposedly. Um, and impact the decision-making process. And so I spent long, long, many, many, I mean, for one environmental impact statement, I'd often, oftentimes spent a month full-time writing comments. Uh, and I, I would write detailed comments specifically on certain aspects of what was going on. And found, to my dismay, that my comments and the comments of so many others, which the Navy is required by law to respond to and address, they would, they would ignore them. They would outright ignore some of them. They would answer a totally different question for others. Um, it not was, really address the question. No, not really address the question at all. They yeah. would, and, most, and half the time, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even acknowledge the question, even if it was stated very clearly. And so I came to realize after years of doing this and, and growing frustration that this whole thing was a sham. And I- The public I, comment process. Yeah, it's it, the whole thing, which it uses huge amounts of taxpayer dollars, I'll have to say, um, because these things, these environmental impact statements are huge, massive, books yeah. that require a team of scientists and writers to work on. And they're a sham. It's a sham. I really feel that the Navy 
as it's as it does this is totally operating uh, at right angles to what Congress intended them to do. So one of your goals has been to try to get the public to become more aware of all these things. Right. Uh, what's been your experience on that side of it? Do you uh, think most people care about about this? Well, some people care a lot. Um, a lot of people don't care that much, I guess. Um, but I, I would think, I would guess that probably the majority of Americans don't want to see sea life harmed by Navy sonar. Probably most of them were like you 17 years ago. They don't know anything about it, right? Yeah, well, a lot of them do, still don't. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's true. I mean, more people know about it now because there has been, there's been ongoing um, lawsuits continuously lawsuits for the last 18 years against the Navy. Um, and they have gotten some, especially like uh, a couple years, or um, 2008, I think it was, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so that was generating some news media in the mainstream press around the sonar issue. And that was good because more people became aware of it. But in the end, it's been extremely frustrating because the Navy inevitably cries out national security and the politicians all, all crumble uh, and, and it's just business as usual for and the they Navy. they get away with doing whatever they want to do. They do whatever pretty they much. want, pretty yeah. much. Occasionally there's been minor uh, victories in, in the courts, but they're very specific and uh, they generally uh, only remedy in very, very specific and very small ways. Yeah. So in general, nothing has changed over the last 17 years. Yeah. Really, nothing has changed. You've recently been arrested twice at Bath Iron Works for nonviolent civil disobedience during the last two christenings of a destroyer, a Zumwalt destroyer, and an Aegis destroyer at Bath Iron Works. What made you decide to take that step and risk arrest? Uh, several things, actually. Um, one was I've gotten to the point where I really do believe, because the environmental impact statement process, that whole thing is such a sham, and our politicians are not doing what they need to do, um, that I didn't know where, where to go and I'm not willing to give up. So I, I thought this is an opportunity to, and at that, at both actually, at both of those uh, civil disobedience actions, I was wearing a paper mache dolphin hat that I had sculpted because I wanted to bring the dolphins and the whales into what we were doing. That, that you know, I wanted people to become, to help increase awareness. That that's another reason, and there's so many good reasons why we need to stop these ships from being produced at Bath Iron Works. There's so many good reasons. Peace reasons, uh, environmental reasons, um, economic reasons. But I wanted to bring the, the whales and the dolphins and ocean life into it, because the Navy is having a huge impact on ocean life. And I should point out, it's not only, it's not only um, the sonar. They use, the Navy uses, routinely uses explosives, uh, missiles. Uh, they, they dump basically trash into this ocean, which they call expended materials. Tons and tons of this trash gets dumped into the ocean. They dump toxic materials into the ocean, so it's polluting the waters. They, they use depleted uranium rounds, which go into the ocean. Um, they're, they are doing a real number on ocean life. A few years ago, I was yeah. in the Philippines on a speaking trip, and while I was there, a U.S. Navy uh, warship came into the Philippine uh, harbor yeah. and dumped all kinds of garbage into the ocean and was caught uh, doing it. And uh, it was a big story in the Philippines, but in the United States, there wasn't much coverage at all. What about where these ships go? Mm -hmm. uh, I know you've been to Jeju Island. Can you talk about that experience and how it impacted you as well? 
That my my time in Jeju. Thank you, Bruce. Explain what Jeju is and where it is. Jeju Island is an island off the southern tip of the Korean Peninsula, and uh, on Jeju Island, there's a village called Kongjung Village, which is where the people are having a navy base built very much against their will. I mean, 94% of the people in that village voted against this base being built. And yet they were, it was forced down their throats, basically. And they, 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 they are the most amazing people. I love them. They've been resisting, and the resistance continues to this day, every day. Um, it's going on 10 years now that they've been struggling to first to try to stop the base from being built and now to just uh, create a culture of peace and oppose militarism. And it, I feel like my time there, it was so inspirational. It was, it was I, I love it. What did you learn yeah. while you were there? And what are the connections to uh, sea life that you learned about while you were there? Well, I mean, for one thing, uh, Right there in Kongjung Village is one of the places where they used to see these 100, I think it's 114, if I remember correctly, estimated remaining Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins that are a resident population to Jeju Island. They swim around the island. They're, they've long been isolated from other populations of these Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins, so they're a very uh, s small, isolated, genetically distinct population of, of these dolphins. And they're now under threat because of this Navy base being built. We know that they're going to be using sonar around there. So that's one thing I learned. Now the U.S. warships will go to this base? Yes, they have already been. In fact, fairly recently the first uh, Aegis destroyer was there. And uh, I, one thing that really st stood out in my mind um, from that time which was only, what was it, a month ago or something, uh, was one of the signs that one of the uh, people at Kanjang held up. And it was, boys and girls of the US destroyer, Jeju is not your playground. And uh, that's, I found that powerful, because I think it's the attitude of the US Navy that the world's oceans are their playground. They're there to do whatever they want and to trash however they want. And I find that just appalling. So this experience of going to Jeju then was also a factor in your risking arrest at Bath uh, Oh, absolutely. Uh, Bath yeah. Ironworks absolutely. on these last two occasions? Yes. What were the consequences so. after you, the first time you went to trial, uh, you were found guilty amongst uh, with nine other people. Uh, what, what were the consequences? Um, the Justice Billings, our, our judge in the, in the trial, was, as you know, he was a, a pretty, um, a lot of us admired him because even though his political views, I believe, were very different from what ours are, um, he allowed us, he believed in free speech, and he allowed us to state the reasons, even against the state's wishes. He allowed us to talk at length about why we chose to do what we did. And that was great. Um, in the end, he, uh, the jury found us guilty. And uh, Justice Billings, uh, although the, the prosecutor had asked for a, a monetary fee, and Justice Billings believed that community service was a better way for us to pay our debt to society. And so he, he um, made us do 30 hours of community service. And so you're in the middle of doing that now? Yeah, we got uh, 24 hours done and have another little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you got arrested again a second time. Right. At a more recent christening. Uh, and so when is the next court date for that particular arrest? That's uh, May 16th at 1 o'clock in, here in Bath. At the at Bath, yeah. West... Bath District Court. Right, right. So you and on this occasion there were, I was part of this group, uh, nine of us uh, called the Aegis Nine. Uh, and we arrested the second time. First time there were 12 of us, 10 actually went to, to trial. Mm -hmm. uh, but this time there are nine of us. And uh, so we'll be in court again on May 16th, as you said. 
three of us, yourself, myself, and one other person, Jason Ron, were second timers. So it's possible that we'll get a stiffer sentence this time around. You must have thought about that. You must have considered that. Uh, it's a long way for you to come all the way from Hancock, back to Bath repeatedly for court appearances. What made you do it again? My to be a repeat offender. <laughs> my anger doesn't let up. My anger and my sorrow about what's happening and my, my uh, as I said, the... Um, Having that, having that U.S. destroyer going back into Kangjung Village and seeing, seeing it right there. This is what the ships from Bath Ironworks do. They go into places where people do not want them and basically ruin their villages and their lives and their environment. And I just, I, I can't sit back and, you know, I just, I don't want to sit back and be quiet. I don't want to be quiet about it. Do you feel so, like you're speaking for the sea life when you do such a thing? Well, I try to. I try to. I hope to. Well, we have just uh, maybe two minutes left. Do you want to make a closing comment to the listeners about all of this? About you know, Sure, I'll, I'll your, try. What's in your heart right now? I feel like, um, I feel like we're at such a... Uh, a vulnerable point in human history and the history of the planet really I mean what we're doing to the planet uh, and the threat of the threat of extinction of life as we know it pretty much um, of course there'll be some life that remains but uh, a lot of it is being threatened right now by environmental devastation and uh, militarism and I mean the, the chances of I mean what could happen in North Korea, with Trump in North Korea now? Um, there's so many things that could happen very quickly that would see us all gone very quickly. And so we have to, I, I feel the need to, to be active and to speak out and to do what, I can, what little I can. Um, to, we, none of us can save the world, but we can all try in our own ways. One of the things that I've been, that I used to write in, as a, closing to my in, um, comments to the Navy uh, in, in my environmental impact statement comments would be, and I don't remember the exact, cent, the exact line, but something to the effect that I hope the Navy will begin to realize that life in the sea also has a right to life and to an existence in healthy environment. And I don't, I think they're so far from that that uh, Somehow we got to change that, and I don't know exactly how. We got a long, long ways to go because the Navy is. is and and I and I'll just take also say it's not it's not everybody. I'm sure there's lots of good folks in the Navy who want to do the right thing, who believe they're doing the right thing. It's the big the the top decision makers who I have the real problem with. Yeah, and it's really important to remember that the military is the biggest polluter on the planet today yes the biggest absolutely well, russell ray thank you for coming on the show thank you bruce and keep doing what you're doing and i'll do it with you all right all right i'll be there with you all the way great thank you bruce and thank you for watching another edition of this issue until next time good luck to you all and please get organized <laughs>